across old Kate Dickens. On Dennis Alexander Watt. And together, we represent more than 100 years of postgraduate veterinary science. And today, we're going to talk to you about the great value of veterinary science to the community and the great value that it is to Russ and I for having lived this long period of time. You agree, Russ? Yes. It's the first time you've agreed with me, Russ. Well, you're, <laughs> after, a diff- you're a difficult man to agree with. After 50 years. <laughs> now, uh, Russ and I are Westies. We come from the western suburbs. And I want to ask Russ what motivated him to become a veterinarian. At what age did you think, I want to be a vet? Not till I was about 19 years of age. Right. So were you, were you born in the country or the city? No, city. Was that, that was, that was West Mead, was it? Correct, at West Mead. Yeah. From what I can remember, you, um, your mother, uh, uh, I, I remember your mother, I think your father passed away earlier. Is that correct? Correct. And um, Russ was at the West Mead near Westmead Station. He had a house there, correct? Correct. And that's where I first met you when I was um, a student. And um, Russ very kindly let me hop in his old and ute, and away we went. <laughs> Remember those days? Correct. <laughs> so um, what school did you go to, Russ? Am I- to my secondary education at Parramatta High School. That was a selective school, correct? Oh, not really. It was a uh, co-educational school. Now, uh, another person who's a well-known veterinarian went to Parramatta High School. His name was Bede Morris. Did you know him? Knew him well. Was he in your... No, he's before me. He's a very famous man. So what I want to talk about is an overview of what the veterinary science course will give you, and then we might ask about how that's influenced you and me over the years. The veterinary science degree is what I call, and what I did call when I was a senior lecturer at the veterinary school in Queensland, the greatest biological science degree in the world in terms of um, depth and breadth. And because of that, it gives the graduate a huge amount of flexibility as far as employment is concerned. The vast majority of graduates go into practice. Many of them go into practice for, say, five or ten years and then divert somewhere else because the opportunity's there. Other people like Russ is completely devoted to practice, so he stayed there where he was. But he didn't just do veterinary practice. So, Russ, um, what year did you graduate? It was 1954. 1954. So, how many years is that now that you've been graduated? 65 years. I graduated in 64, so, you know, it's about 55 years graduate. So, we're well over 100 together. But well, we've had diverse lives. We've had diverse... We've had diverse jobs. And the point I'm trying to make here is that This degree permits the graduates to have those diverse jobs. Okay. You graduated, you probably went to, started at um, university at about 18 years of age, and you finished a five-year course at about 23. Oh, yeah, 23, 24. Hmm. You still haven't told me 
why you actually wanted to do veterinary science. You said that you decided to do veterinary science, but what actually attracted the, of all the things you could do, is it because you had a nice dog, a nice pet, you, you were attracted to your dog and your cat, and you said, well, I'd like to treat them, you know, for the rest of my life and look after them, or how did it come about? I think I had a inbred interest in animals, and I liked the outdoor life. Right. So, um, in my case, it was quite a bit different. I went to uh, Wagga Agricultural College and I just wanted to do agriculture. Um, and uh, I got a job at, with the CSIRO as manager of the parasitology block at Badgerish Creek. And when I was there, there was a bloke called Mike Jones who was in final year veterinary science. And we got friendly with each other, and he says, Dennis, you're fairly switched on. Why don't you do veterinary science? And I didn't know where the veterinary school was or anything. And it sort of, the germ of the idea got into my head. And uh, I worked on it, and um, I decided to go back and uh, get my matriculation. I didn't have my matriculation at that time. So I, I uh, worked, I went to, uh, as a student to Arthur Phillip Evening College, which is the equivalent of a TAFE, and I worked there and I matriculated from Arthur Phillip. I happened to top the state in agriculture from Arthur Phillip, which has never been done before, uh, nor since, because most of the People who uh, did well in agriculture went to agricultural high schools. I can tell you a little story which um, has been told over the years at, during the veterinary science course and that one of the professors, a uh, professor of surgery and later dean, Professor Gunn, was, th was uh, one day got very upset with one of the students. His name was uh, Stan Hobcroft. And uh, he said, Mr. Hogcroft, why did you do veterinary science? And uh, student Hogcroft said, sir, because it was the closest to Parramatta Road. <laughs> Stan Hogcroft was uh, quite a character. He actually was a hiker and he walked from from the veterinary school at Camperdown, when he was a, a student doing practical work at Camden, he hitchhiked all the way. Now he did, he passed veterinary science, and then he went and did medical science, and he became a surgeon in medicine. Knew him well. What he's, year? He's in my year. Right. So, what I what I said is that has come down like a legend, you know, and it says a lot of things really in many ways, doesn't it? Hmm. There's a guy who is sort of criticised by the head of veterinary surgery who becomes a medical surgeon. <laughs> that, he was a joke. surgeon at Black County Hospital, just opposite me, a practitioner. Really. Saw him a lot. Amazing, isn't it? You know, when you talk about coincidence. So there you are. You've graduated, right? What happened after that? What did you do? How, did you, what did you decide to do? You know, you've got, your, you've got your degree in your hand. You've got a whole plethora of opportunities to do a whole range of things. So presumably, you said, I'm going to stick with practice. You, you really enjoyed that aspect. That's correct. But I played outside where I lived at Westmead and started. You mean Mum's old place, do you? Correct. I seem to remember something now um, that you said your surgery was in Mum's kitchen. Yes, and uh, mainly inside, now in the room 
one of the rooms. <laughs> when you started, which is in, you say, 1958, was it? Something like that, yeah. 1958, what, where did you decide to go? Did you just say, well, I'm setting up a practice here, I'm putting up my plate at Westmead, That's right. and we'll see who comes? That's right. So who came? Oh, well, I put a plate up. Anyone wanders in who needs to be met me. Yeah, but cattle and place. sheep can't come in. And, and, no. and the fact is that at that time, when you took me around as a student, there were dairies everywhere, weren't there? Yeah, well... Correct? So I moved to Blacktown. Yeah, how many years after... Oh, I just forget. Quite a few years. But and then I became involved in large animal work, and there's a lot of dairies around Blacktown and surrounding well, districts. Well, I, I used to go with you to the dairies, a lot of them. One dairy added on to another dairy to we used to visit. Peel, wasn't it? 40, 50 dairies. Peels. They were big time, big weren't they? Mm. So then you you move from the small animal at Westmead getting into mixed practice. That's correct. So you were starting from scratch again when you got came here to Blacktown. So... Um, how many, did you work by yourself for a long time or did you get other people? I remember a bloke called Henry Cotton. You worked part-time. You worked part-time. Yes, he was. I oh. worked a, a bit with you too uh, before I did my other uh, occupation, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, uh, but at one stage, didn't you have a very large number of staff? Yeah, we had about seven vets when we were in full-time even eight, I think it's sometimes dairy practice. In dairy practice. It was, it was big animal. time. So Horses, pigs. Pigs? Hmm. Where were the pigs? There's always piggeries around here. Yeah. Schofields, Quakerzell, back down. You've got to realise Blacktown's a rural area. Yeah, yeah. All right. All gone now. <laughs> I'll say. So, um... You then proceeded over the years and eventually um, urban development took over all the dairies. Correct. About what year would that have been? Uh, would that have been sort of 30 years ago? Yeah, gradual. Gradual spread of urbanisation with houses. The um, land became valuable for people to live on. Yeah. So then further you... And further So that moved you into more and more into... Um, small animals. Just small animals. Now, you've done a couple of other things with your life. Um, one of them was to become uh, mayor of Blacktown. Mm. How did that happen? I just thought one day the elections I'd give it a go and uh, I became elected and uh, um, It's a little bit different from what you told me Well, simple I'll, 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 I'll say what you told me 30 years ago well, You I said I don't trust that that uh, party so I'm going to become an independent and keep them honest <laughs> Well, the decision to become... It's a bit the, like that, wasn't it? <laughs> the decision to become being local government as an independent, and I served 33 years in local government, yeah. mayor and deputy mayor for quite a long 33 time. years. That's quite incredible. And uh, the point about this is that the people trusted you. You are independent, and they more or less had sentiments like you, so... This is another segment of veterinary science, you know. There's another person I, I recall called Bruce Eastick uh, in South Australia who became the um, um, head of premier of South Australia. He had a property out near the Barossa there. I, I, I went to South Australia for a while 
and met up with him there, Bruce Eastie. So this shows the diversity of, of veterinarians. Bede Morris uh, became the head of the very first uh, John Curtin Research Institute. And that's not too bad for a veterinarian in charge of all those people. And he worked on immunology and cannulated the, uh, the sheep and studied the lymphocytes and the like, the immune response, a pioneer in that area. And he went to Parramatta High School. He went to Parramatta High School. There's another notable person too. His name's Peter Doherty. And Peter Doherty is the only veterinarian in the world to get a Nobel Prize. He was a Queensland graduate where I went to. Mm. Now, from my point of view, um, um, but, but you've done other things too. What about your cattle property and your sheep? Oh, well, I, when did that all start? I, well, I uh, sheep probably at uh, Cullen Bullen, which is up the Mudgee Road from Lithgow. I had a, a merino sheep stud for many years till the dread of Yoni's disease got amongst them. And, oh, really? And I disp disposed of them. Then I went into Angus Cattle. I had anger stud for many years. Did you do any um, embryo transfer or anything like that? I did embryo transfer quite a lot in the dairies around here and uh, in my own stud, yeah. So once again, it shows the um, versatility of, of the veterinary science degree. You were able to do that uh, because of that. Now, in, in the early days of... Um, uh, cattle practice, they used to AI cows and all the dairies for people around for quite a many years. Yeah, I, I used to go with you on that and um, it was, you know, you were very busy. Every night we'd go out and do the AI rounds. <laughs> Standing from Liverpool to Richmond. <laughs> and what time did you finish? Well, no, it <laughs> One o'clock in the morning. Often. Yeah. So you've got a property up there, so that obviously you, you had to work 26 hours out of 24 each day to go up there and come back all the time. Right. Very taxing. Plus, at the same time, you're mayor of Blacktown. That's right. So you've had a very full life, haven't I you? I have. I've had a life. Life's been good to me. Yeah. Haven't got any problems and... So Only right, two. If this that's why I work every day, and, and so you, I enjoy it, and I'm able yeah, to. Yeah, I can understand that, Russ. When I uh, graduated, I uh, during the in my second year, I was offered a cadetship for uh, um, veterinary public health, food safety at meat export abattoirs, which I took. And, and so when I graduated, um, I was sent to Western Australia to, uh, to a couple of meat export abattoirs. They shot the people, so I, I worked at two at the same time. There was a shortage. And at the, at, at the same time, um, I was collecting pathology material uh, because I, of all the things that I was interested in, I was interested in pathology, and it was a great place at the, at the uh, meat export abattoirs to collect pathology. So um, I, I used to take that pathology over to the South Perth Veterinary Diagnostic Lab every week. And when I was over there, a bloke called Stan Dennis, I don't know whether you remember him or not, he's a, had a PhD from Sydney University on perinatal mortality of lambs. That's how it worked. And then he spent time at Kansas University. The other person there working as a pathologist was Malcolm Nan. And so uh, Stan Dennis and Malcolm Nan uh, eventually got together and, and presented a, a, a case to the West Australian government to have a veterinary school established in Western Australia 
they those two were the driving force be, uh, behind the establishment of Murdoch. Um, Mal eventually became dean, and then he became vice chancellor of the university in Northern Territory. Stan Dennis went back to Kansas as the dean and then went to the West Indies, which is a, another university part of, of Kansas. So one day, I'm bringing over my uh, pathology, and Stan says, why don't you do a master's degree, Dennis? Um, external through Sydney University. Cost nothing. <laughs> now it would cost 20000 bucks at least. Uh, cost nothing, and he said, uh, nobody's done the male reproductive pathology of the Merino Ram in Western Australia, and we will provide all the facilities, histopathology, all the diagnostic, if you'd like to do it. And so uh, I said yes. And so um, I did this for a couple of years, and and then I, they asked me to open a paper at, at the Australian Veterinary Association a couple of years later, uh, which I did. And that paper actually was a bit sort of opposed to the main speaker, which created a bit of a controversy. Um, all I did was just look at the literature and I found that the literature conflicted with what he was saying. So I said so. Um, quite often it doesn't pay to uh, be so forthright but anyhow a lot of the people didn't like what I said but a, a person called Professor Francis came up and said "Could I? would you like to go to dinner I said okay would you like to Professor thank you so I went to the dinner and he said uh, um, I'd like you to um come on the academic staff with me as a lecturer in pathology and in veterinary public health, teach that. And I said, okay. So that's how I fell into academia and I was there for 22 years before I actually, after that I, I, um, I, I became chief veterinary pathologist and head of the National Veterinary Laboratory in Papua New Guinea for three years. And then I went back to veterinary public health and meat export laboratories until I retired at 80, 80 years of age. Um, I don't call it retirement, I call it more or less a sea change because I'm devoted to scientific writing. So I'm 83 and you're not far off 90. I'm doing scientific writing seven days a week and Russell Dickens is in his practice seven days a week. This illustrates the diversity of that veterinary science degree. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you've got anatomy, yeah. physiology, biochemistry, animal husbandry, microbiology, pathology, surgery, uh, medicine, biostats, epidemiology, all everything, veterinary public health. And see, you see, the, I was in veterinary public health with the Commonwealth Government. It was the single largest employer of vets. And there's, uh, the importance of, the, of that area, quarantine, is to keep out exotic diseases. That's extremely important because Australia's free of those serious diseases like foot and mouth disease and the like, swine fever. So they do a great job, really. And the fact that we're an island is a good idea too. Now, we haven't touched on another thing that you've done, a little thing called hematology of the koala. Oh, Can you tell us a bit no, about no, I that? I took an interest in koalas because... What year me. did that start? Um, oh, I wouldn't know the back of it, but um, now as friends of Koala Park, John McNamara and his family. Uh, when, uh, but you were the vet went there, uh, weren't you? And, uh, I was always amazed that so little had been published on the health and diseases of koalas. 
And one of the basic things you needed was a hematology, which hadn't been done to any great extent. And that's why I embarked on a, um, a project for a master's degree in the hematology of the koalas by collecting koalas in the wild from various parts of Australia and in the sanctuaries from various parts of Australia. So how many uh, samples did you collect? It was a few hundred, was it? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, about a hundred was quite a few. So how, how do you how do you get uh, what's the uh, how do you get a koala out of a tree and take a blood sample and where do you take it from? Well, it's difficult to get them out of a tree because you've got to climb. Someone's got to climb the tree and catch them in a net. Do you yeah. shake the tree or? I, <laughs> How do you oh, get them out? <laughs> well, you've got to put a net over them and get them down or put a a, a, a cover over the head and, and entice them to come down. Then someone at the ground has got to catch them, put them, put them in a bag. Then we bleed them from the cephalic vein. So did you climb or did you get a, oh, yeah, a young yeah. bloke to climb up? Oh, bits and pieces here and there everywhere. Hmm. Mainly Yankee. Now, well, it's a long while ago and you're able to climb. I've read that thesis and you did a bit more than just hematology. Uh, you did, from what I could see, you did a uh, longitudinal case study on stress. And as far as I know, I mean, it's a relatively simple sort of a thing, but it, it proves something to me anyhow from a, from a science point of view in that uh, what you did was you put these koalas in a bag for a while and you took their hematology over a period of time. And what you found was a great reduction in the lymphocytes. There was only about one, uh, what was it, one, a, a thousand after just a few hours now that is a fundamental proven truthful method of of proving that stress has an effect upon the lymphocytes and therefore immunosuppression yes. so when a, when a, any animal is immunosuppressed it renders itself uh, susceptible to all sorts of diseases Correct. So at the moment, there's a problem with chlamydia. Did you, were you involved with chlamydia at the time at all? No, I only became involved with chlamydia by my <clears throat> friendship with Dr. Steve Brown, who did chlamydia as his um, PhD thesis for Queensland University. Did you see chlamydia when you were doing the, those studies? Uh, as far as I know, I don't think you saw too much chlamydia, is that correct? Oh, we saw uh, uh, conjunctivitis, we saw what they syndrome called dirty tail, which is all related to chlamydia in one way or another. So the, the, the conditions were there, but we didn't realise there were chlamydia, although we'd taken, we had chlamydia swabs from the eyes. Not easy to grow, eh? No, chlamydia. You've got to be specialised to grow chlamydia. Yeah. Specialised laboratories. So is that the fully blown chlamydia with the conjunctivitis and the like? Because it's it's a urogenital disease as well, isn't it? It Correct. affects the genital system. Did you did you see any involvement? Did you do any postmortems at all and and see any involvement of say the urinary system? Well, yeah, or yeah, genital lot. system. Yeah, a lot. Mm, it was very common. You did. Mm. So you were actually seeing chlamydia. Seeing it, but not. But not. It was well, by that to at to that to stage, to they had not isolated. Until Doctor Brown came to conclusion it might be chlamydia and uh, started to investigate it. To, to, to the um, well, a lot of a lot of academics and practitioners. Uh, didn't uh, agree with his thoughts, but now it's become quite common. As uh, what he, what Dr. Brown found was quite correct. The only thing that's different is that it, 
at that time it's regarded as Sidakai related to the Parrot family, but now they call it Pecorum, P-E-C-O-R-M, as you know, yeah. which is a, a different um, serotype. Yeah. But now it's known as Pecorum, and I think Sidakai is a little bit different. I'm not sure, but yeah. something like that. Well, um, it's been a long voyage, Russ, for you and I. And uh, well, what, yeah. what's your reflection now about the whole thing of veterinary science and its impact upon you? No, but I think uh, as regards work with koalas and native animals in general, I was involved in Koala Park and... Um, Featherdale for many, many, many years with koalas and. Um, How serious, uh, Russ, is 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 the possibility of extinct extinction of the koala? How serious is it? Serious is it to be oh, recognised um, as serious by the government? It should be that the um, um, the depletion of uh, their. Uh, their habitat by the by the uh, increase of commercialisation and the uh, dreaded uh, caterpillar dozers and knock all the trees down. Yeah. And koalas are being pushed further and further, and they have a unique desire for different types of uh, Do they? for a eucalypts, and you just can't move them from one spot to the other willy nilly, hope that they can survive because. So you have to actually. If you're going to relocate them, you'd actually have to go onto the place that you're going to relocate and see if there's suitable eucalypts for the koala, mm. correct? Mm. Because not all eucalypts are favoured by the koala. That's correct. Well, I don't, I don't know which ones. No, I don't know well, whether yeah, you but do. No, but we do know in uh, its particular type, but we don't know specifically, specifically at the moment that I know, why they like eucalypt A but don't like eucalypt B? Mm. And they could be growing next door to one another. And really, and that's fascinating. We're still trying to, and um, nobody knows. Uh, yeah. Now another um, cause of high mortality rate from about twenty six percent are caused by trauma on roads, roads accidents. So it's vital that the um, koala be located away from the urbanised areas, away from those roads. Do you agree? I agree. Mm. I seen the, in the radio today, the RSPCA said they'd seen many hundreds injured koalas last year. It's tragic, isn't it? We've got, we've got an icon. We've had this problem. People have been talking about this for how many years, about the road accidents? 20 years, 30 years or more? Still well, nothing done. Well, the Koala Foundation was set up. I'm on the board of the Koala Foundation. Are you? So it's set up in Queensland, and uh, they've been allocating funds to different things in the koala's well-being for many years. And uh, But the problem is that the morbidity and mortality rates haven't gone down, Russ. No, they haven't. And so that, that's, that somebody's got to an answer for that. And so I think we need a, a, a fresh look at this, don't you think, about well, you what know, to do? Well, you need to try and dig it all out. You know, they've made a vaccine against chlamydia, but yes. how do you administer a vaccine to uh, native animals? Yeah, very how difficult. Um, and uh, uh, as I say, there's probably other diseases lurking there too. That uh, yeah. um, I've seen cancer in koalas quite commonly. I've have you? Paxion in koalas. Um, so you've seen cancers? Uh, uh, poisoning, oxalate poisoning is common from uh, different uh, dietary sources. And, and the pathogenesis of that is not, not known, is it? No. But, so there's a lot of research to be done, isn't there? Yeah, oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, and um, no, there's a lot, you know. And, uh, uh, I think the government, don't you think the government can do a lot more uh, to try to address the problems? We can provide them with the prevalence of the various diseases. We can 
for example, you know, trauma from rose. So it has to be low COVID, but it's not that simple, but it can be done. Just because it's difficult, it doesn't mean that you don't do it, does it? See, and the trouble with the koalas will migrate many, many kilometres in the breeding dawn. Do they? That's another matter. So you'd have to get into a very isolated area, otherwise they might get onto the roads. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, So, there we have it. Um, I think we've demonstrated through our discussion that there's a lot of flexibility in the veterinary science degree. Um, And as we said at the beginning, this is... This, the um, veterinary science degree, is the greatest biological science degree in the world. And I think we've demonstrated it reasonably well. No, it's, what do you uh, think? Oh, yes, yeah. And, and Would you like well, to I, make I, some I, further I, comments? No, I'd say in my own particular, because it's been a great basis for my so-called achievements. Yeah. And I got the Order of Australia yes. for... Uh, not only that, a number of other things. Well, both of us are life members of, of the um, AVA, and recently you were given an award. You were recognised by the AVA for your contribution. I was on, on the alumni of Sydney University. Who, uh, so, uh, you know, it's been lots been of a, awards. A whole range of things, and I've used my things. I've, I've been on the Ethics Committee of Westmead Hospital as a veterinarian representative since its inception. Yeah, there's another. I've been on the another, uh, on the advisory board of the uh, Salvation Army for good, many years. Good. Not because of my uh, veterinary thing, but because of my position in society. Yes. I've been on the board of the uh, multicultural. Um, so you've fitted all this into sort of, 24 hours. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, uh, I don't and, believe you. I think it's 20. Q&A. You've got an extra few hours out of it. Most I commendable. Do I still do all those things now. And, uh, Very full life. Full life. And Would you uh, ask me why I become a vet? When I graduated, when I matriculated, I could have done anything at Sydney University. You got good results. No, no quotas. No, I didn't. But I couldn't. All you had to do was matriculate. Five passes. But that's all you had to do. <laughs> I used to wander around Sydney University and say, "Will I be a uh, engineer? An Will engineer? I no, be?" No, I wouldn't be an engineer because it wasn't brought up. But could I be an uh, agricultural? Could I do medicine? Yeah. Uh, can I do something else that's in the university? But I wanted to do something I could be by myself. I always liked the vet school down the end of Science Road. Yeah. And um, I. Um, and you always like. Did you have uh, pets from the very early in I life? Mean, I like dogs. I didn't do vet because I didn't never been in the country as a country, cows and horses. Yeah. But I, I, if you go back, I did a year of dentistry before I did a did vet. Oh, did you? So you started off thinking about doing dentistry. What else could I do? Yeah. <laughs> So, At any rate, that's, that's a long way back. Okay. Well, um, quite a life. Quite a no, life. Very full no, life. No, I might say, Dennis, I've been lucky in life. Um, I'm relatively well. Um, You've only had um, two hip operations. Well, yeah, but they're, they're all bits and bits, but I haven't got all the... They're structural ones. Yes. And they're all due to sporting injuries, not degenerative injuries. Yeah. Well, they can tear the structure to pieces as long as mm, anyway, as long as they don't take the brain, as the philosopher said. I think, therefore, I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a friend down at Westman Hospital, a prof, who says, "In life, as long as you're warm and vertical, you're halfway there." <laughs> and not horizontal and cold. Is that what you mean? <laughs> warm and vertical. <laughs> Okay, is there anything else you'd like to comment on in your life? Um, Do you think we've covered it reasonably well? I've had a happy life. I do have a happy life now. I do like doing. Um, It's damned hard to to catch up with you, even for this interview. I um, enjoy it. I still have a... 
a well now it helped uh, you know and back down the holding facility it used to be called pounds for oh yes you've then, been to the pound I'm, 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 I'm a, um, helped quite a lot in the in the direction of the pound and i did do you still go there uh, on a regular basis to the pound i'm still in contact with the pound and uh, when i was in council well i had a more direct role but um no, I still have a role, and um, no, um, uh, I enjoy, oh, yeah, that's a problem. I think, I think I'm employed of it. I'm in, I think you've been responsible in your position as mayor for the expansion of of, of, of that and changes to the structure. Well, Is that build, correct? Build another pound, and um, I have been overseas. A couple of years ago, I went to uh, America with some council people to have a look at. You know, animal holding facilities there, and you know, we rebuild another one. And what did you find out? Uh, were improvements uh, that improvements, you could bring back here? Improvements and type of control, and uh, it's a simple thing in life. That there's many more animals available for homes than their homes are available for yeah. animals, and especially in cats. I think in the future there'll be a Probably with the oversupply of cats, because uh, yeah. Yeah. there's not enough controls, especially in New South Wales. Yeah. Uh, but I say controls, but you might say what type of controls? Yeah. And that's another matter. Yeah. You know, uh, so there's a bit of a cat problem, is there, in yeah, the suburbs with is. feral? They go feral, feral do they? Feral and oversupply. Kill of birds and the like. Uh, even uh, Blacktown Pound has a a so-called no-kill policy, and they this the uh, uh, dissex animals. Every animal that leaves the pound one is dissex before it leaves the pound. So we're cutting down the numbers of cats and dogs breeding in the in the community. But how many would have to be uh, euthanized, euthanized every week because they haven't found a home? Any? Uh, no. Many? Many, yeah, many, yes, many. Of them, no, Hundreds. Not a hundred a week, but... Um, Sometimes people just leave their... go away for holidays and just leave their pet wandering oh, around. Yeah. Is that correct? Correct. Mm. That's not the, very the, nice, the is it? public's apathy towards the proper control of pet is quite a great concern to authorities. Cats... Yeah, you know, dogs can uh, got to be easy control because they don't, they can't survive too much without a home. Mm. Where cats can survive everywhere, yeah. and they don't need necessarily need a owner. That's right. Because so they go feral. They scavenge in ferals and survive, and, yeah. Kill and, birds, and all over the world wildlife. that that is a problem with the oversupply of cats because yeah. people will go and feed cats because they feel sorry for them, but they breed and more and more come. Yeah. All right, well. But overall, thanks, Dr. Watt, for um, my little conversation with you this afternoon. Um, well, uh, I, don't, I don't have to say that you're an icon. Uh, you're a pioneer in not only in hematology, but I was actually impressed by that little bit of work you did on stress. I'm very interested in stress mm. and immunosuppression and then recrudescence of organisms, just like in AIDS in humans. The, uh, the virus attacks the lymphatic system and, and the patient dies from the most innocuous diseases. Mm -hmm. So it's so important, I think, to be aware of the immunology. And I thought that looking at lymphopenia was a very good indicator of immunosuppression right. and you showed yeah. lymphopenia even after a few hours wasn't it in the bag, it? In the bag because you're forced to do it mm. but you did a properly controlled piece of science because you used the same animal instead of using different animals you used the same animals it's called it's called a longitudinal case study and so you, you started here and then you took your samples from the same animals. So it was scientifically more correct than taking samples. Mm. 
So it was only a small sample size, but it's quite valid. No, well, I came to the conclusion it was relative by stressing them before you did it, and if you did them straight away. Yeah. I think I said that you could stress them by dropping from a great height and not too bad, but if you put them in a bag for a couple of hours or half an hour, it would have a, rel a significant effect on their stress. Well, I think that's got ramifications in the future too about how to handle the uh, koala. Hmm. That's about it, I think. Okay, eh? Very good. Well, thanks. It was not traumatic. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks very much.